Hello, History 362. So today I want to talk about uh, sort of blow-by-blow blow, uh, history of the Antigonid dynasty um, from around 272 when Antigonus Gnatos finally secures um, his father's old kingdom uh, with the death of Pyrrhus, um, uh, down uh, probably to uh, the accession of Philip II in 221, so about 50 years of Antigonid history. Um, now, Antigonus Gnatos is, uh, as a ruler, a relatively cautious and small c conservative one. Um, he has been struggling mightily simply to be the king of Macedonia, um, and he doesn't prove particularly interested in further uh, conquests or expansion, but rather with consolidation. Um, he's not a particularly militarily aggressive king, um, and indeed uh, tends to rely very heavily on diplomacy um, in order to maintain his position. Now, the early years of Antigonus's restored reign are pretty successful. Um, in 268, um, uh, Ptolemy II um, sponsors uh, a revolt in Athens, um, providing probably money and also at a certain point landing uh, ships and troops in Attica. Um, this is a very poorly understood war called the Cremonidean War. Um, in fact, we almost really only know about it other from a, a few sort of scattered references in our sources and from an inscription which the uh, Athenians honor, um, Acromonides, um, uh, the, the, the man who is sort of the Athenian point person with Ptolemy um, and uh, was also served as a Ptolemaic mercenary um, and uh, after whom this really poorly understood conflict is named. All we do know is the uh, Ptolemies clearly are forced to withdraw, do not make any gains, um, and uh, uh, whether this is part of the same war or a different war, in the early 250s, uh, Antigonus scores two big naval victories um, over the Ptolemaic fleet at Andros and Kos. Um, and the Ptolemies, of course, are reliant on their fleet to control the Aegean. And so the fact that the Antigonid fleet um, is able to crush both of these um, uh, is a pretty uh, remarkable victory um, for Antigonus Gnatus. Um, and in some ways, we might say the, the 250s sort of represent the apogee of Gnatus's power um, over Greece. Um, now, of course, uh, he, he does use coercive force to maintain his position, uh, in particular maintaining his uh, traditional bases, the fetters of Greece um, at the Piraeus. Um, he also, for a long time, uh, relies on tyrants, that is, uh, uh, helping to support um, uh, sympathetic tyrants in Greek communities. And one advantage to doing that is he doesn't actually have to send Macedonian soldiers to those communities and pay them. Uh, he simply um, backs diplomatically the tyrant, and the tyrant uh, sort of rules the city, pursues the policies that he's comfortable with. Um, uh, and of course, one downside, of course, is uh, you know Greek cities uh, uh, at this point, right? Really, as early as the fourth century, but it can be in the third century. Um, do not consider tyranny um, a particularly legitimate form of rule. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, at this point, Greeks consider democracy as almost kind of synonymous with autonomy, although Greek versions of democracy are, at this point, relatively mild. The, most Greek city democracies are nowhere near the, the radical democracy, say, of 5th century Athens. But still, uh, Greek, Greek cities generally, to have a tyrant imposed upon you or have a king support a tyrant is actually seen as an infringement of your autonomy, even if the tyrant is one of your citizens. Um, uh, and indeed, one of the cities in the northern Peloponnese uh, that has a tyrant imposed upon it is Sicyon. Um, and uh, indeed, one uh, sort of uh, reaction that finally comes to this policy takes place in 251, when a young uh, Siconian, uh, um, uh, young man, young sort of aristocrat um, named Aratus, um, stages an internal coup, overthrows the tyrant of Sicyon, um, and sort of reestablishes uh, uh, a, a democracy in Sicyon. Um, now, um, Aratus realizes that the position, Sicyon is, is a very small city. It's not traditionally been a particularly important city um, in, in the Peloponnese, I mean, really ever. Um, and so he realizes that he's in a weak position. 
if they want to keep the tyranny out, if they want to maintain their autonomy, um, that they need to go bigger. And, and Aratus, remember we, we talked about how one way you can go bigger are federal leagues, a coin-on, singular coin-on, plural coina. Um, and there is such a federal league in the northern Peloponnese, although at this point it's relatively small, relatively un uncoordinated, and relatively unimportant, and that is the Achaean League. Um, at this point, Aratus joins Sicyon to the Achaean League, um, and actually, therefore, but, but also becomes a major player, an energetic player, in turning the Achaean League itself um, into uh, a force to be reckoned with, particularly militarily. So the, you know, even though Sicyon is a particularly important city, once Aratus kind of gets uh, a position in the Achaean League, um, he goes a long way towards uh, uh, making it a, a, a force in the northern Peloponnese. Um, now, as it turns out, um, um, uh, poor uh, Antigonus Gnatus has bigger problems right now than whatever has happened in Sicyon. Um, namely, um, he has a, a nephew whose name is Alexander, um, who has been put in charge of the garrison at Corinth, so one of the most important strategic sites um, uh, for Antigonus's overall control of, uh, of, uh, of, of Greece at, at proper, right? The huge fortress on this huge stone mastiff overseeing uh, this key land route across the Isthmus. And that land route actually goes both ways. Not only does traffic move uh, uh, from the Megarid uh, into the Peloponnese, but also ships um, move, uh, move north-south. That is, goods uh, uh, stop are, uh, are taken up to be loaded onto another ship so they can go, um, uh, go, go, go elsewhere. Uh, and indeed, there is not only is there uh, are, do goods say move on wagons, but in some instances, small boats are even hauled north-south across the isthmus. So this is just an incredibly uh, important kind of uh, hub um, and of course, he has the most important, the, the Acro Corinth is the most important military um, uh, uh, site there. Um, uh, but Alexander revolts and basically proclaims himself a kind of mini king. Um, uh, he doesn't get a lot of traction, but he still enjoys the Acro Corinth. Um, and Antigonus is sort of frustrated in dealing with him. Um, uh, and it's, it's possible that Alexander, who finally dies, uh, around 249 is uh, is poisoned or he just simply kicks the bucket because it's the ancient world and people die all the time. Um, his wife subsequently, um, uh, Nicaea, um, continues to hold this position and uh, Antigonus Gnatos is so desperate to get it back that in 247 he proposes marrying his own son and heir apparent, Demetrius, the future Demetrius II, to Nicaea of Corinth. Um, and she agrees. Um, uh, perhaps not all of the details have been worked out. She may continue to think that she will personally control the Acro Corinth. But at this wedding, and I, I think this is one of the, the more entertaining moments in the Hellenistic world, at this riotous wedding where I think there's probably very, very heavy drinking, everyone's partying, um, uh, uh, Demetrius and Nicaea are down in Corinth, um, and Antigonus Gnatos, who at this point is a relatively um, uh, old man, um, he breaks away, he goes up with a small party and climbs up the Acro Corinth. Um, and again, the Acro Corinth is an incredibly steep fortification. I mean, I've, I've hiked up it, and I'll be honest, I was huffing and puffing and winded by the end. Um, so Antigonus and his crew, they go all the way to the top of the Acro Corinth, um, and Antigonus, the, the king, just knocks on the door. Knock, 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 knock. Um, the garrison, who may be a little surprised about what's going on, open the door, and Antigonus goes inside with his men and takes possession of the Acro Corinth. Um, uh, and uh, whether Nicaea liked that or not, Antigonus again has control of this key position. Um, now, unfortunately for Antigonus, that doesn't last long, um, because in 243, Aratus of Sicyon, our, our young, ambitious, um, uh, Achaean statesman, um, pulls off perhaps one of the uh, sort of biggest special, most effective special operations 
um, of the Hellenistic world. That is the capture of the Acro Corinth um, by the Achaean League. Again, the Achaeans at this point are still not big military players. Um, but at this point, the Acro Corinth is only garrisoned by about um, uh, 400 troops. They're described as all Syrians, so these actually may be refugees uh, from uh, the Seleucid Empire, from the current chaos that's going on with the Laodicean War. Um, uh, but there's a garrison of 400, um, and uh, Aratus and a number of Achaeans sneak up in the middle of the night, infiltrate up the hill, and succeed in capturing the Acro Corinth from the Antigonid garrison. So therefore, from 243 onwards, the Achaeans have the Acro Corinth, um, uh, and uh, they also incorporate Corinth into the Achaean League. Corinth still one of the most wealthy, prosperous, and prestigious cities, uh, poles, in, uh, in Greece. Now it's part of the Achaean League. And the fact that the Achaeans now control, uh, uh, you know, include Corinth and now control the most important military site um, really starts to put the Achaeans on the map um, uh, in terms of being at least a regional power. Obviously, they still aren't anywhere near as powerful as the Macedonians, but within the northern Pel Peloponnese, they are actually able to uh, uh, exert a lot of agency and also, by capturing the Acrocorinth, really frustrate um, uh, mass in, in, you know, the, the plans that Antigonus has towards maintaining a stable Macedonian hegemony. Um, now, Antigonus Gnatos dies in 239, um, probably already at this uh, point, um, his son, Demetrius, uh, is, uh, is already sort of crowned as king and is ruling as a kind of co-king. Um, this is a pretty common Hellenistic practice to make sure that there isn't even a, a, a lag between the old king dying and the new king being coordinated. He's already been coordinated, and so you have total and kind of perfect um, um, continuity. Um, other monarchic societies, uh, you know, separated by time and space do this too. For example, the French Capetians uh, during the Middle Ages, the European Middle Ages. Um, uh, so Demetrius, uh, his, his reign is uh, not, not as well documented. Indeed, um, really everything in this lecture is one of our more poorly documented moments in Hellenistic history. Um, in part because one of our most important narrative histories, that of Polybius, if you're taking 363, you also know I'm talking constantly about Polybius because he writes a universal history of both Rome and the Hellenistic East. Um, Polybius is an Achaean, um, uh, an Achaean, actually high-ranking Achaean officer. Um, but Polybius really doesn't pick up his narrative of the Greek world until around the 220s. Um, and so what that means uh, uh, is that we, we, we don't really have a good narrative coverage. Um, so for actually, for a lot of uh, what I'm talking about today, we actually have to rely on the various biographies of Plutarch. Um, Plutarch doesn't write a biography of, uh, of the Antig of Antigonid monarchs, which is too bad, um, uh, uh, although he does provide us with a biography of Demetrius Poliorcides in some ways, the kind of founder of the dynasty. Um, but uh, we don't, we, after that, silence. We do, however, get a biography of, uh, of uh, Aratus and a biography of the Spartan king, uh, uh, actually two Spartan kings, Aegis and Cleomenes, um, who are active for, in the 240s and then again in uh, Cleomenes in the 220s. Um, so oftentimes we actually get a better sense of what's going on through the lens of uh, the opponents of the Antigonid dynasty. Um, but you know, even Plutarch is oftentimes not as interested in a lot of the political or military details, um, which can also be unfortunate. Um, suffice it to say, uh, D Demetrius's reign is not as well documented as we might like. Um, he faces a, a big challenge, though, in the union of the Achaean League, this up-and-coming league, um, and the Aetolian League. The Aetolians, remember, have been around for a while. They first come to prominence during the Gallic invasions when, after the death of uh, Ptolemy Kronos, at that time the king of Macedonia, um, the only people who are really able to organize Greek resistance against these Gallic invaders happen to be the Aetolian League, and they are the ones who save Delphi, and having saved Delphi in 279, they never want to let anyone forget that. Um, so the Aetolians control the Delphic Amphictyony, the um, sort of council that governs the sanctuary at Delphi, a very, very prestigious um, uh, fact. Um, 
Uh, and they also are happy to uh, expand their control by, um, uh, in various words, conquering cities and regions and forcibly incorporating them into the Aetolian League. Um, uh, the Aetolians are also just notorious plunderers, um, and indeed, in some ways, uh, uh, you know, one, one author has even called the, the, uh, the dynamics of the Aetolian League the politics of plunder. Um, uh, and, and league membership oftentimes has a lot to do with who you can and can't plunder. Um, and Aetolian diplomacy oftentimes has a, has a lot to do with um, do the, the Aetolians consider you someone who shouldn't be plundered or someone who's open to being plundered by sort of uh, private or, or local, you know, locally organized piratical raids. Um, that said, uh, the, um, the, uh, in his reign, um, Demetrius II, um, seeks to strengthen his ties with Epirus by marrying the daughter of the queen of Epirus, also named, this queen is named Olympias, um, and the daughter uh, Pythia uh, will actually be the mother of Philip V, um, uh, his, one of his eventual successor. Um, uh, and um, uh, this, this union uh, leads to a war with the Aetolians, because the Aetolians are trying to incorporate big chunks of Epirus into their league, the Achaeans join the war on the behalf of the Aetolians. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we actually now have a war between Philip and the two leagues um, supporting this Epirate monarchy. Um, now, unfortunately for Demetrius, the Epirate monarchy itself collapses. Um, it's essentially overthrown and ultimately replaced with um, a kind of Republican structure. And this new structure also sides with the leagues. Um, so this is a kind of frustration that Demetrius faces um, uh, late in his life, um, and uh, he dies in 229, uh, relatively young, um, and this also creates a succession crisis, because at this point, his son, with his, uh, he, he's also engaged in serial polygamy. He's been married to a daughter of Antiochus I of, of Syria. He married Nicaea of Corinth to get the Acre Corinth back, and now he's, he's married uh, the Epirate princess, Thea, to, um, uh, 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 to secure this Epirot alliance. The child that he has is, is Philip, Philip V, who is a very small child at this point and not in a new position to rule. Um, now, here, uh, the kind of, um, I want to say, the Republican, and I know that's a real stretch, aspect of the Macedonian constitution comes into play a little bit. Um, other Hellenistic king kingdoms, particularly the, uh, the, the Ptolemies, are perfectly comfortable having a child rule with a, a regent um, imposed. But Macedonians seem to be a little less comfortable with this. We actually already saw this way at the start of the course, where Philip II starts off briefly as the regent um, to, uh, to Amitas, and then simply becomes the king, um, presumably with uh, the acclamation of the army assembly. Um, and this seems to simply be that the Macedonians, well, yes, we need a king, and monarchy is seen as the sort of natural way of doing things. Um, the Macedonians sort of demand that their king be an aggressive, militarily effective uh, male, um, and therefore are less likely to tolerate rule by a child. Um, so they don't tolerate it back in 359 BC when Philip actually goes from being regent to being king. Um, and they don't really seem all that interested in 229 BC, also a moment of, of military upheaval. Um, and so while Philip V, in theory, could uh, ascend to the throne, um, instead uh, his uncle Antigonus Doson um, is named the king. And here, Antigonus Doson seems to make it clear from a pretty early point that he will rule as king, but that he will pass the kingship back to Philip when he dies. So Philip is already brought out as his successor. Um, uh, so uh, here we actually have a, a succession that actually could be potentially contested, but it goes surprisingly smoothly um, in, in no small part thanks to the willingness of Antigonus Doson to, um, uh, to continue to support um, uh, Philip's claim, at least after his death. So Antigonus is now the king in 229, Antigonus Doson. Um, and uh, his reign is really actually going to be shaped largely by events that are going on in the southern Peloponnese. Uh, and and uh, this is actually sees the last sort of gasp of Sparta as a important international 
player. Um, now, Sparta has, of course, not been an important international player for a while, but um, starting in the 240s, uh, a Spartan king named Aegis IV um, tries to revive Spartan power in part by actually um, expanding the number of full Spartiates by giving land to either enfranchised uh, Laconian helots. Remember, there, there are still helots in Laconia, serfs in Laconia, who serve their Spartan masters. Um, um, and also by enfranchising potentially mercenaries. And uh, these attempts in the 240s don't go well because uh, uh, Aegis IV is murdered for his efforts by conservative aspects of Spartan society. Um, but it's quite likely that one reason that, that Aegis IV is all of a sudden saying, hey, I need to revive Spartan manpower, I need to increase the number of Spartiates, I need to increase the number of people who can serve in the, at this point, very small and not terribly effective Spartan army, um, is because he's looking to the northern Peloponnese and saying, whoa, the Achaeans have really got their act together. And they are actually, the Achaean League is actually expanding as more and more Peloponnesian communities are saying, either A, I want part of that, or the Achaean League is also at times strong-arming communities into joining. Um, so it's possible that Aegis's kind of initial plan to expand the Spartan citizen body through enfranchisement uh, is a response to the expanding uh, league. Um, uh, in uh, uh, he, uh, a sort of, uh, he's replaced by his kinsman, Cleomenes the um, uh, Third, uh, pursues a number of the same policies, only much more aggressively. Um, and Cleomenes' position is somewhat stronger because he essentially stages a coup. He's the king, but he stages a coup against some of the other oligarchic entities in Sparta, particularly wiping out the board of ephors. Uh, kind of oligarchic uh, group of supervisors um, who have a lot of, sort of power and prestige in Sparta. Um, and this allows him to actually ram his policies through of, uh, of not just enfranchising um, helots, um, but also even of, of hiring mercenaries and then offering them Spartan citizenship um, and, and actually trying to dis distribute land in Sparta um, so that those mercenaries can be given a plot. Um, uh, and this, this seems to be done precisely to revive, to, to increase the number of, of Spartans who can serve in the Spartan army. Um, for a while, Cleomenes is quite successful with a, an expanded army. Um, he goes on, he starts a war with the Achaean League in 229, and initially he is extremely successful. Um, by uh, 225, he has uh, the he, he is he's operating in the northern Peloponnese, having beaten the Achaean army on multiple occasions, having run circles around Aratus, who, despite his success at the after Corinth, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be as successful a general when it comes to kind of set piece battle, um, and he's besieging the after Corinth, about, and, and actually is is on the verge of of capturing it. Um, and Aratus, who, you know, the loss of the Acrocorinth, um, on one hand, would mean, you know, the loss of basically everything he's devoted his military and political career up till now. Um, but he now sort of has to decide who he's going to lose the Acrocorinth to, the Spartans or the Macedonians. And he decides that the Spartans, particularly under Cleomenes, are a threat that's close, and the Macedonians are a threat that's far away. So he cuts a secret deal with Antigonus um, Doson, um, that uh, Antigonus, if he enters the war, will be able to take and occupy the Acro Corinth, which of course at this point is already being surrounded and besieged by the Spartans, so it's already kind of, it's already lost, basically. Um, and that the Achaeans will form an alliance with Macedonia. So this is a huge diplomatic coup for, uh, for Antigonus Doson, particularly given that Demetrius uh, before him had been really hapless facing the com combined armies of the Achaean and Aetolian League aligned with the sort of uh, the, the Republican Epirotes. Um, uh, that, was, that was actually a force that he wasn't really able to project power into central, into central Greece for the Peloponnese against that configuration. Um, so Antigonus um, uh, therefore moves into the Peloponnese with a large and effective army um, and engages at one of the great battles of the Hellenistic world, the Battle of Selassia in 222, engage, brings his huge like, phalanx against the phalanx of Cleomenes. It does seem that Cleomenes has partially reorganized the Spartan army to also fight as, uh, as heavy phalangites, um, but 
Despite Cleomenes uh, in, you know, enfranchising new Spartiates uh, and his, his land reform proposals, um, the Spartans are defeated decisively at the Battle of Selassia as the Macedonian phalanx fights its way up a hill and pushes the Spartans away. Um, and uh, Cleomenes, after the Spartan army is broken, uh, is forced to flee, where he takes up service in the Ptolemaic court. Incidentally, how did, how did Cleomenes get the money to pay this new army? Admittedly, some of it comes from offering people a plot of land. Um, uh, all, uh, some of it, he actually will have uh, allow Helots to buy their freedom, and he takes that money, and that helps fund his army. But a lot of his funding has come from Ptolemy. Um, uh, in that, um, uh, that this is a tr this is a pretty standard thing that the Ptolemies do, um, uh, supporting uh, supporting their opponents um, with with money not, rather than necessarily um, uh, manpower. Um, so with the uh, Battle of Selassia, Antigonus Doson is victorious in the Peloponnese. He's crushed the Spartans. Um, he uh, he has the Acro Corinth back. However, there is a threat from Illyria, from the north, and Antigonus Doson has to rush north uh, to deal with it, and there he dies suddenly, supposedly while uh, um, uh, extorting, extorting his men. Um, uh, he may have an aneurysm of some sort. So Antigonus Doson is dead in 221 BC, and therefore the young boy that he had you know, ruled, but ruled promising that he would succeed, finally succeeds, in 221, Philip V um, becomes king, and we will talk about the reign of this young man um, uh, next time. I'll see you then.